Hey everybody, it's Stephen from Asian Boss. As part of our mission to bridge social and cultural gaps between Asia and the West, we always try to talk to super interesting people from all over the world, whether they be creators, entrepreneurs, and industry leaders. Why? Because we want to share their stories and insights with you and learn something from them. Remember, we cannot make positive impacts on the world without working on ourselves first. Lewis Howes is one of those super inspiring people that I've been following for a long time. Lewis is a New York Times best-selling author, keynote speaker, industry-leading show host, and a former pro athlete. Are you the best version of what you can be right now? Or are you feeling a little lost like I was? If you feel like nothing's going your way no matter how hard you try, and you just feel like giving up, hey, I understand exactly how that feels, and I hope that you get something out of this conversation with Lewis House. Lewis literally broke everything down in his new book, The Greatness Mindset. So let's just dive right in. Lewis, uh, it's an honor to have you on. You're somebody I've been listening to for a very long time. And uh, you know, you have one of the top podcasts in the US and you actually have a book coming out as well, uh, which I've read and it's just a fantastic book. You know, I'm, I'm usually obsessed with personal development and to give you, give you some context, you know, uh, maybe because of the pandemic uh, or just the way that the economy is currently, I think a lot of young people from all over the world, including from Asia, they're, they're losing a little bit of hope. Uh, and what I mean by that is that all young people are thinking about, including here in South Korea, they're looking for the, the job security, safety, you know, everybody wants to become a, a civil servant, work for the government for a stable, <laughs> stable paycheck. And, you know, because you get the, the pension of 401k thing. Uh, and so no one really wants to take risks. And I guess fundamentally people are even wondering, like, what's the point of like dreaming? You know, why do you even need to be great in the first place, which it's kind of like you could you could you know chuck that as a, as a cultural difference, but I don't know I don't know what the, the situation is currently in in the U.S. with young people as well. So maybe we can sort of start from there. But if you could just like explain a little bit about sure. where you come from and how you got to write this book and everything. Well, Stephen, here's the thing. I mean, um, thanks for having me on. And I think there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of pain in people's lives, not just because of the pandemic, but always. I grew up very insecure, very stressed, very uncertain of why I was even here as an existence. I was like, why am I alive? What's the point of all this? What am I supposed to believe in? Why do I doubt myself? Why do I feel rejected all the time? And as I grew into you know, my teen years, it was like, okay, it, everything just was confusing. And it was hard to find a sense of peace and a, and a sense of feeling confident and certain about who I am as an individual and where I'm going. And I think <clears throat> my life has been a journey of a few different stages. One, trying to accomplish and succeed as much as I could and prove people wrong and somehow prove that I was capable. So I did that in sports and then I started to do that in business. And on the outside, it looked very successful. But on the inside, I was suffering. I was suffering with a lot of questions uncertainties, insecurities, and fears. And so I would project out into the world and the world around me a false sense of confidence and ego. And that protected me in certain ways, but it left me feeling like I still was never enough. And it didn't matter how much money I made or how successful I was or how recognized I was, I still didn't feel good enough. And it's so interesting, Stephen, we're talking about this because I was just at a mastermind this weekend with many of the top leaders in this industry of performance, of entrepreneurship success here in America. Uh, a lot of people you've probably follow currently that you've probably read their books, if, people that have you know private planes and hundreds of millions of dollars and all these things. And not everyone, but many of them were asking themselves this question, am I good enough for the next thing? Am I able to launch this new idea and put it out into the world and 
what if I fail? And what if I get made fun of? And what if it doesn't work out? And what if I, my audience laughs at me? Like, it doesn't matter if you're just getting started and you're sleeping on your sister's couch like I did for about a year and a half with no money, no to college degree, no talent, no skill, or if you're, you've hit a peak of success, people still doubt themselves. They still have insecurities. They still have fears that hold them back. And for the last 10 years, Stephen, I went through a journey, a personal journey of discovering myself, a healing journey, uh, a self-love journey, and a journey of making a bunch of mistakes and learning through pain and suffering and mistakes. And by no means do I have it all figured out. By no means am I perfect, uh, and I'm still on that journey. But what I've been able to understand through personal pain and suffering and learning and growth and transformation, and also interviewing some of the world's greatest leaders, billionaires, you know, best athletes in the world, musicians, actors, all that stuff. There is a process to overcoming the uncertainty, the pain, the insecurity, the fear that you're experiencing, to getting so clear on what you want and figuring out what that is, and then having the courage to overcome one of these three main fears that I talk about in the greatness mindset. The fear of failure, the fear of success, and the fear of judgment. What other people think about you. And I'm not sure about the culture in Asia, if people are concerned about what their parents think about them, their friends and peers think about them, who's following them on social media. I don't know if that's a fear that people have in Asia, but it's a fear here in America that a lot of people have. And at the root of all three of these fears is I am not enough. And when we can figure out where we don't feel good enough. That's when everything starts to shift. It's some of the, the hardest work you'll ever do for yourself because no one wants to face this. It's scary, it's challenging, no one wants to talk about it and face it, but it will set you free to be able to create what you want as an entrepreneur, in your career, in your friendships, in your intimacy and relationships. It will set you free to be authentically who you are, to step into that and not worry about what people are thinking about you necessarily, but be okay and love and accept yourself, even if they are judging you, even if you are quote unquote failing, you get criticized more, the more successful you become. Of course. And whether you are broke as a joke, sleeping on your sister's couch or your parents' basement, or you're just getting started, or you're going after your dreams and you're helping people and you're growing and you're improving, you're gonna be criticized. It's inevitable but I'd rather be going after what I enjoy, what I love, what I'm excited about, and be judged than do nothing and be judged. Well, I mean, you talk about your uh, pain from your childhood, but let's say from the like, you know, people who don't know you, they look at, they take a one good look at you, and here's this like super tall, good looking former athlete, and you know, they might be wondering, come on, we, you know, how could it have been that bad that you, right. so maybe you could just walk us through some of the sure. real struggles you had from the childhood days to the extent that you wanna get into. Yeah, of course, I'm an open book. And um, it's never about comparison of who's had a harder childhood, of course. Or who's had more difficulty, adversity. We, we've all faced what I call big tom traumas or little traumas, and all of them affect us, and we all respond to them differently. Uh, but for me, <clears throat> a number of kind of key things that I was sexually abused when I was five. So one of my first memories was being sexually abused by a man that I didn't know. And we are programmed based on what we experience. Our beliefs, our thoughts, our feelings, our identity of who we believe we are becomes programmed through our childhood. This is scientific. This is you know what every therapist talks about and psychologist talks about. And so that was something that happened early on, which made me feel like, I'm not enough, which made me feel like I'm abused, I'm taken advantage of. And so that was a program that was kind of a seed throughout my most of my you know teens and 20s that people are out to get me, people are trying to take advantage of me, people are trying to abuse me in relationships and business and sports. And so that was a program that I embodied based on that experience. My brother was also in prison when I was eight years old. He went to prison for four years. Uh, for selling drugs to an undercover cop. And so when I was eight, I really didn't have any friends because th in a small town in Ohio, the parents of my neighborhood didn't want their their children to hang out with me because 
if my brother was bad, I must have been bad, right? If he's making a mistake, I must be making a mistake. So it was a very lonely time where I felt like, again, I'm not enough. And there's nothing I can do that would make me lovable or have friends. So I never really felt enough. I never felt like anyone understood me. I didn't have any friends. And I struggled. I was alone a lot. And I think when you're alone, a couple things can happen. You can continue to feel lonely or you can observe other people. So I didn't have friends, but I observed other people. And I was always observing and watching human psychology and human dynamics. And I think it's one of the reasons why I'm so curious about people today. I ask questions all the time because I had that story early on. This kind of childhood stuff that I went through, again, not comparing it to anyone else's, it drove me to want to prove people wrong. It drove me to say in my teens, like, okay, I, I'm not good in school, but I started to get good at sports. And I said, I'm going to become so big, so strong, so fast, so talented that no one's ever going to make fun of me again. No one's going to pick on me again, pick me last. And people are going to want to hang out with me because I, now I have value. I became, you know, one of the best athletes in my school, went in and played college football and All-American and decathlon and then professional football. And it worked to get me external results, but I still didn't feel good enough no matter how much it accomplished. And then when I got injured playing football, um, I literally had a surgery on my wrist that left me in a cast from here to here for six months in this position. Wow. And I was living on my sister's couch for a year and a half while I was recovering because um, I didn't have money. I didn't have a college degree. And also my identity was t tied around being good at sports. Mm -hmm. I was no longer able to live. So I lost my identity that gave me all my value. I had no money. I was injured sleeping on my sister's couch for about a year and a half during the 2008, 2009 uh, recession in America <laughs> yeah. when everything crashed with uh, the housing market and, and stocks where people weren't hiring at that time. So it kind of felt like 2020 when it happened <laughs> yeah. for me. And I remember being very scared and very intimidated about what am I gonna do? And I'm a big believer that if we want to become more abundant, more powerful, more great in whatever we do, that we need to create a list of all of our fears. I call it my fear list. I've got this whole process in the book as well about how to do this. You wanna create a list of your biggest fears. These are the things that make you feel the most insecure, the most shame, and the most powerless in your life. And early on, mentors told me like, if you wanna become powerful, you've gotta embrace your biggest fears and make them an asset. Make them something that you're proud of, not something you're afraid of. And that's why I started to do. After my lowest moment of getting injured, having a surgery, being on my sister's couch, having no money, being in credit card debt, all that stuff, I created this list and I started going all in, like the Batman of my fears and just embracing them. And it was the most terrifying emotional time to put your, myself in embarrassing moments, put myself in public speaking class every week when I was the worst and everyone's a professional. I uh, put myself in salsa lessons when I didn't know how to dance. Whatever it was, I was like, this is such a big fear of mine. I got to go all in on these things. So that was in my mid-20s. I really started to attack these fears. And it became such a powerful asset once I did because I gained confidence. I gained belief. I gained a sense of love and appreciation for the hard work that I was putting in to develop these skills and over, overcome these fears. And that's one of the steps that people gotta do. You gotta create your fear list. You gotta go all in on the one that scares you the most. When you do that, you will become so much more powerful. So you're in your mid twenties and you're doing all these sort of like, you know, pushing your comfort zone to take on these new activities. Uh, at the time though, what was your definition of greatness? Like, oh, you know what, I would have been happy if I get to this point. Uh, obviously you would have probably far exceeded that by now, but at the time. My definition of greatness at the time, I didn't know what it was. It was success. Success exactly. was greatness to me. Right. Originally, when you're in survival mode, it's hard to, you can dream big about something, but you're like, I just have to get 
off the ground first. So for me, I was my definition of success was like getting off my sister's couch. How can I make enough money to afford my own apartment? So it was an obsession and a scramble and a, and a chase and a hustle of getting out of survival mode first. And I think there's a seasons of life that we have, and I hope no one ever has to go through that, but it's, it's not fun getting out of credit card debt, figuring out these things. But I also look back at it, and it was one of the greatest lessons and experiences those kind of two years um it was a master class in in life and money and management time and all these different things in a couple of years that was the idea first then i had to unlearn scarcity when you have nothing and you put your value in i'm not good enough i'm not good enough unless i have this Once I had more money, I was just stacking it and hoarding it because I was like, I never want to be poor and broke again. I never want to go back to the couch. I'm just like, you know, for years, I would sit in the middle seat back row of the cheapest airline just to like save money. I would sleep on couches and friends. Anywhere I travel, I was like, where can I stay for free? I wouldn't even get a hotel room. This wasn't until like five years ago when I started getting hotels. I was like, (laughs) I just got to save my money and spend it wisely. I didn't have a car for many years. I just walked everywhere. I was like, I'll just bum rides to wherever I need to go. And I had to shift out of that. That was a while of unwinding scarcity. I don't feel as bad when I spend it, when I invest in it, when I give it away to people, to causes. I feel like I trust it's going to keep coming back and overflowing. And I feel safe. So I had to shift the relationship around money, which most of us are never taught how to have a relationship with money. So I wanna, I wanna define success versus greatness because I think uh, this will be helpful for people. I know for a fact that you have a very elaborate and very cool definition of greatness. So you, know, you yeah. can just lay it <laughs> yeah, out yeah. there, yeah. For sure. You know, most young people wanna be successful. Most young people wanna make a lot of money. Most young people want to have passive income. They want to be able to buy cars and watches and houses and go on exotic trips around the world. They want to be able to pay for you know expensive nights out with friends and show off. They want these things. They feel like that's what success is for most young people. Maybe not everyone, but that's what a lot of people define success as. And success is selfish. Success is about me. Success is about winning. Success is about looking cool. Success is about looking good, success is about having things and possessions. And greatness is different. Greatness includes your dreams, it includes your goals, it includes your talents, your skills and putting them out there, but it's not about me, it's about we. And when we shift our vision and our energy from success, which is about me, towards greatness, which is about we, that's when we have a renewable energy inside. That's when we have an abundance that flows within us and an energy that is so positive and powerful and magnetic around us that we attract things. Things come to us, opportunities, synchronicities that we never even thought of. They start unfolding and coming to us because we think about the collective. We think about our friends, our families, our communities, our platforms, not just how do I look good to impress people, But how do I lean into my talents and my unique gifts to pursue my dreams and make an impact on the people around me in the process? That's when it becomes a renewable energy inside of you and fulfilling. Success is not, at the end of the day, as fulfilling as people think it is. It is short-term rewarding, but is not long-term fulfillment. And greatness is a fulfillment that I've never felt in my life when you start to think about serving other people around you in the pursuit of your goals, in the pursuit of your dreams, that's when it becomes an incredibly different life. I totally uh, understand and live that definition myself. Um, I guess to play the devil's advocate though, you know, a lot of people Bring would it. argue that, uh, well, how do you think about serving others when you're literally struggling yourselves, you know, whatever you make, you can't even keep up with the inflation and, you know, they can't even save money. So a lot Mm. of people, especially young people in this mindset, no, it's got to be, I got to take care of myself. So I don't think they exactly see the connection of like by trying to be great and getting into the abundance mindset, Uh you naturally track all of those things. But it's like, it's falling on deaf ears, right? Because if you're talking about to this, this like average person, it'll just like just fly over their head, right? Mm -hmm. 
I think when you're in survival mode, it's hard to think about others. And there's and there's nothing wrong with being selfish when you're in survival mode for a period of time. Mm-hmm. You don't want to give it all away and be like, I'm unselfish. I'm just going to help everyone. Right. No. Uh, you want to make sure you're taking care of certain things and being discerning when you're getting started. But there's a lot of people that live by the, the, the message of if you want to accomplish all your dreams and goals, help others accomplish their dreams and goals. That philosophy has supported me for a long time. So I created skills and then I helped someone who needed those skills. They gave me money. That was the exchange of value, right? So I still had to find a way to help others or find offer value to other people. I believe the mo- the amount of money you make is the amount of va- is related to the amount of value you're able to offer people. But the faster you can go from survival mode to service mode, the better. But I like to ask this question to the wealthiest billionaires in the world that I've interviewed: um, What is the key to making more money and feeling fulfilled? Because a lot of people know how to make more money, but they don't feel fulfilled. It's never enough. And so many people have told me who are extremely wealthy that the key to financial abundance is giving. The more they give without an exchange for something in return, but they give, they always say, I make more the next year. Yeah, yeah. Uh, maybe that just speaks to how I suppose westernized I am in terms of my mindset, but I, I think we just cannot discount a cultural sort of differences. So, for example, you know, tell me, like in Asia, this this whole state of philanthropy, like it's it's not give? part of the culture. Yeah, exactly. And you know, the, the the gap between the rich and the poor, it's just getting more and more extreme by the day. Let me ask you a question. So, what is the the mentality of Asia and South Korea, I guess, is it different uh, in terms of service, in terms of abundance thinking, in terms of giving thinking, in yeah. terms of, of this mindset? What is the mindset or mentality of the majority of society? Obviously, there's people that think differently and do things differently, but what is the kind of the sense of the society? Yeah. So from our observation, and that's why we are so, we have to be in tune with how people think uh, in, the, in the West versus sort of in Asia. And in Asia, people's minds tend to be, yes, it's very community or group thinking minded. It's all driven by the group thinking that, you know, we don't, we don't want to stick out. And if somebody does something that is super generous, like that's unusual, you usually look at that with a bit of a suspicion, like, oh, are you trying to, like, I don't know, evade taxes or, or it's like there must be some sort of a, a something fish going on, like some sort of a corruption. And usually oftentimes they get caught and uh, uh, they're on the news for embezzling the fund. And then so people's like trust at, at the lack of transparency. I'm sure that these are like, you know, global issues, but so I think people become very cynical uh, in general. So when someone is generous, does generosity happen or, or are people just like, oh, you have an angle if you're a giver or generous? I, I, I'd say at, on, at an individual level, it does happen because I've seen many generous people uh, at a personal level. But I think as a, as a society, and I'm not just talking about Korea, I'm talking about a lot of, lot of Asian countries is that it's just people don't understand the whole concept of giving, uh, you know, that as, as a way to fulfill, to get the sense of fulfillment. Do you feel like people in Korea uh, or South Korea and Asia are fulfilled and internally happy? I think there's an interesting uh, stat, and I don't know how true this is, but I tend to believe it. Uh, they actually did a happiness survey in North Korea, let's say. And uh, yeah, a lot of people are kind of happy that they, they they're, they're satisfied with what they have. But then in South Korea, where it's supposed to be one of the wealthiest now, most developed countries in the world, I don't know if people will be very happy. And I think it's reflected in that, that happiness index. Why do you think people in South Korea are unhappy? You know, exactly. maybe they have wealth and exactly. financial abundance and cars and fancy watches and homes. But yeah, yeah. why do you think they, why do you think then that people are successful yet unhappy. Because they still have to compare themselves to other people. And then you, you've got to think about how farther you need to climb in order to show greater status. 
and here's the thing. That's why, you know, I feel like uh, in, in my book, The Greatness Mindset, I talk about this where yep. if we in the core, we have these three main fears, and at the core of those three fears is I am not enough. Yep. It doesn't matter how successful you will become, you will still not feel enough. What's everyone else doing? And well, he's got more, so I gotta go get more to feel enough. And if that's the key, you're just gonna be running yep. for more all the way till you die and never feeling like enough. Exactly. And so instead, why not reshape the way we think about ourselves in our societies and start to believe we are enough? And I think the only way we can believe and accept ourselves fully and love ourselves fully and, and, and believe we are enough is by healing the wounds and the memories and the moments that told us we weren't enough. I don't know if everyone watching or listening in Asia is like, this is the dumbest thing I've ever heard, <laughs> or if it's actually resonating so much. I don't know. Maybe it's resonating, or maybe people are like, this is the craziest thing ever. I think at least in America, uh, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, you know, people are, maybe largely thanks to people like you, you know, guys are able to articulate and express their, their feelings and past traumas. They can actually address it, talk to, you know, their, their psychiatrist or a therapist. In Asia, like, if you say, oh, I'm, I'm going, I'm going to go talk to my therapist or psych, that's like a, you know, it's, it's a big deal. <laughs> what do deal. people say? It's a, it's a big really? deal. It's almost like, oh my God, are you, are you going to be okay? Like, as, as if you have some sort of like cancer or something. Let me, let me ask you this. Let me ask you this, Stephen. Do people go to the gym in Asia? I think, uh, at least in Korea, it's now re every everybody starts working out, and you know, yeah, yeah. So okay, people are starting to do it, but it's not like a it's not a weird thing if someone's like, I'm gonna go work out or go for a run or go no, like lift some all. weights, right? Yeah. Why isn't that a weird thing? Why can't people exactly. just exist and walk around and not have to go to the gym? Are they okay? Is everything okay? Like, are, <laughs> are you okay if you go to the gym? Yeah. Why work on your physical health? and not your emotional health. Right, right. It's not about something wrong with you if you go to the gym. It's wise to go to the gym. It's wise to go for a hike, to go for a run. It's wise to eat nutritious foods because you take care of your physical body. It's wise. So why would it be weird to go to the emotional gym, to reflect on things that you're afraid of or ashamed of and work them out and, and work it like you would your body? Just like you do with your physical body, you're, you're building muscle, you're killing off dead cells that yeah, don't yeah. support your longevity. You've got to do that with the thoughts and feelings as well. The thoughts that you think, that should feel normal. That should feel wise. And someone that's going to work out their emotions or their mental thinking to improve it is going to help them live happier, healthier, longer lives, just like people going to the gym. And so I think people got to realize that the way you think and the way you feel dictates the actions you take in your life. No one who does anything great is understood by everyone. No one, it doesn't matter what you're going after, people are gonna doubt you, they're gonna question you, they're gonna say, be safe, go after what we want you to do, don't go do this, are you sure? No one's ever done this before. No one does anything great without people being concerned about them. It just doesn't happen. And that's part of the journey, that's part of the hero's journey, is we're leaving your hometown, leaving the tribe, if you have to. I'm not saying you have to do it alone without friends and family, but some of you might need to leave for a period and then come back until you're accepted. One observation that I would actually make is uh, throughout my life, I, I came across a lot of people uh, that I thought were smarter than me, uh, that they, they were way more talented, but I guess what differentiates them and, and what I do and where I am is literally how big my vision was. And, and that's one of the things that I actually want to get into is young people, especially in Asia, they don't really dream big anymore. Why not? <clears throat> I don't know. I don't know. Maybe they feel like they're stuck in, in, in some, some tough place where you, you're in that scarcity mindset or in certain religions like in Buddhism or, or you know, things like that. It's like, well, just learn to be happy with what you got. Your expectation is here and your reality is here. Bring your expectation down. Or sure. ra rather than working hard to, to get to that point, right? Maybe happy medium is somewhere in between. Uh, I don't know, but yeah, mm -hmm. people, people just don't 
let's say, want to be great. If my own dad will say, you know, like, oh, what makes you happy? Oh, just, just having a normal life, right? And I'm like, huh, it's a very interesting mindset. I think number one, you gotta know yourself and know who you are. And if that makes you happy and you feel fulfilled and you feel like you're making the best impact of this life that you're given, and that's your path, then that's great. For some of us, we feel called. There's something inside of us that feels called. And we have to make sure that we feel called from a place of using our gifts and talents to the, the best of our abilities, not from a place of I'm not enough and I need, I need to feel better. So I need to go do a bunch of things so I can fill myself up. Because that's when it's a disaster because you go after a life of accomplishments and you still feel, don't feel enough. That is suffering. And that is not a happy, good life. Just making money and accomplishing, but still feeling miserable. So if your dad can say, I love and accept myself for who I am, and I'm at peace with where I am right now and what I'm creating, that's beautiful. But for those others of us who are watching Asian Boss, they don't come to Asian Boss to live like that at this season of their life. And we have to understand first, know yourself and know your season. You know, your dad's been there and done that. And he's at a season of like, I want to reflect and enjoy and connect and, you know, do different things. You might be in a season of, you know what? I want to multiply my talents. Mm -hmm. There's a story in the Bible, the Bible about the three sons who were given a talent. And one of them wastes it, one of them hoards it, and one of them multiplies it. Mm -hmm. And I'm at a season where I want to multiply my talents. I want to build them, I wanna maximize them, I wanna give them and serve other people because I believe this season of my life is a season of growth, yep. of contribution, of giving, of mastery, of all those things based on where I'm at inside. You gotta know yourself, what brings you joy, what brings you peace, and know your season. Maybe at this point you can actually uh, spell out what your mission is because I think it, like, it's such a, such a huge yeah. mission that people I think deserve to know. Sure, my mission is to serve 100 million lives weekly to help them improve the quality of their life. That's a lot of people. Simple, it's a, and that's been a mission for 10 years. You know, I started the School of Greatness 10 years ago, and uh, that was the mission early on. I wanna inspire 100 million lives to help them improve the quality of their life every single week. Wow. And we're not there yet. We, we haven't accomplished it yet, but it allows me to have a target there's a list of questions and reflections. Again, I talk about it in chapter three of the book is the whole section on meaningful mission. So if you're like, well, I don't know what, to, what I want and what's enough and what's not enough and what should I be really doing? And you're gonna figure out what season of life you're in based on a set of questions. You're gonna figure out what will be rewarding for you and then how to, in one sentence, define your meaningful mission. I would bet 95% of people watching or subscribe to your channel they couldn't tell you in one sentence what their meaningful mission is for this season of life. And if you are feeling unfulfilled or you're not fully fulfilled as you would like to be right now and you don't have a meaningful mission, that is step one. Get clear on understanding the season you're in and um, what you wanna create. And that will help you just make better decisions in your life. I think you gotta be willing to, to dream and get creative and become an alchemist of your own life. You know, The Alchemist, the book, is one of my favorite books. And um, I love the idea of taking an, a thought and then manifesting it into reality, into the physical world. That's what you do as an alchemist. You come up with an idea and you create it and you make it and it becomes true. Here's a, a, a slight cultural curveball. And I think you mm -hmm. actually address this towards the, the end of your book. I think a lot of people from Asia, because of that cultural influence, they have this tendency to be a perfectionistic. In other words, mm. even if you are ready technically, and everybody would say you're ready, you're like, oh yeah, but I'm not ready. And you have this great rule, uh, maybe you can share with our audience to break through that. But I think a lot of people, uh, especially young people, they say, well, I will do it when I'm perfectly ready. I gotta go get this degree to become a true expert. But up until that point, I'm not an expert. So I'm not ready. Yeah. I mean, I, I've, never, I've never been uh, perfect in anything I do. And you can't be perfect and great at the same time because greatness is not about being perfect. It's not about perfection. It's not about achieving perfection. 
It's about having the courage to put yourself out there and improve along the way. It's about the progress you create in motion, in action. And let me ask you a question about this. If for all the people watching who are on YouTube right now or wherever you're watching or maybe you're watching your clip on Instagram or WhatsApp, any technology that you're using, TikTok, any of these platforms you're using, when they launched the apps 5, 10, 15 years ago, it was not a perfect platform. It didn't look anything like the platform you're using today. It continued to evolve over time. It continued to update 2.0, 10.0, 50.0. They keep evolving based on the need of what the audience wants, the community wants. If they would have said, you know what? Ah, it's not going to be perfect, the first app launch. They would have never put it out. You wouldn't have YouTube. You wouldn't mm -hmm. have TikTok. You wouldn't have Instagram. You wouldn't have what all these platforms you use. It doesn't look like what they did when they launched it. And it didn't discourage these entrepreneurs from launching these platforms and launching these apps. They put it out there knowing it wasn't gonna be perfect. That's how you learn how to make it better. You know, a lot of people are afraid of failure, but failure, if you shape it differently, is just feedback. It's information, it's data that's telling you what's working and what's not working. So you have to know that when you launch something, it's probably going to suck the first time you put it out there. And that's okay, it's a good thing. Because then you're gonna see who likes it, what do they like about this thing, what's working, what's not working. Cool, give me more feedback. I want more feedback, give it to me so I can make it better for you. Mm -hmm. And that's the way you gotta think about these things. Greatness is not about being perfect. Greatness is about having the courage to put something out there and progress it. And that's the way you gotta look at it. Amen. For a lot of people, they just have, seem to have this mental block that, uh, uh, and I think it is truly one of those cultural conditionings that uh -huh. um, maybe, like you said, it is, is a fear of being judged, a fear of failing or fear of being looking ridiculous uh, in front of others, especially yep. in, in Asian context. But um, I really like that rule where, and I don't know if you want to talk about it now or just wait for people to read the damn book, but uh, you know, like you just, you just like make that incremental 1% improvement. So maybe you can talk a little uh -huh. bit about that. The 1% rule, uh, exercise, strive for 1% better, uh, form during a push-up, during uh, a blog post, during an interview, during whatever. Strive for 1% better every time you put that thing out there. Whatever it might be, it's the 1% better. And don't let the tension between where you are now and what you don't know hold you back from where you want to go or who, who you are becoming. And I think if you make the game of life about the 1%, of like, how can I improve 1% every day? Something I do with this podcast, over 1,300 episodes, 10 years. I'm thinking of all the feedback I get. I know you get a lot of feedback on your YouTube comments, so do I. Okay, is that information, that comment, useful for me? Let me reflect on it. If it is, how can I make it better in the next episode? Let me just get a little bit better. And you do something over 10 years, like I've done and over how many years that you've done and you think of 1%, not I need to be a thousand times better every time, 1% better, you will sustain something truly inspiring and great over time. It's just not gonna happen overnight the first time you do anything. I can really r recommend this book enough. I, I'm gonna personally like buy it for a lot of people, a lot of my friends, and uh, maybe at some point I can get a signed copy as well from you. Um, of course, man. Are you coming to LA ever? <laughs> yes, we actually have plans to come to LA uh, sometime this year. So we definitely want to... Let me know. I'll sign you a copy then for sure. That's awesome. That's awesome. For people to find more about you and your podcast, you have a YouTube channel. Maybe uh, you can just like share some of your social media links. Sure. Yeah. The School of Greatness podcast, whether it be on YouTube, uh, you know, YouTube slash Lewis Howes or School of Greatness on audio. The Greatness Mindset. You can go to Amazon or wherever you get your books and get this, The Greatness Mindset. Um, I'm sure you'll have it up in the link in the description. If you go to lewishouse.com slash TGM for The Greatness Mindset, it'll take you to a page where you can get some bonuses and other goodies there. But um, if you're feeling stuck, you're feeling like you want more in life, externally, financially, physically, but also you wanna feel really good about yourself too, then this gives you the whole process and the whole roadmap of where you are to where you wanna be and doing it in a sustainable place, doing it from a place of calm internally, not stress ex externally.
Well, thank you for uh, sharing your wisdom and, and your story. I think a lot of our viewers will really appreciate it and uh, can't wait to catch up with you in person at some point this year. Appreciate it, Stephen. Okay, I'll see you next time.